Today is August 22nd, 2022, and my guest is philosopher Kieran Setia of MIT. He hosts the podcast Five Questions, where he asks philosophers five questions. His forthcoming book is called Life is Hard. His latest book in print and the subject of today's episode is Midlife. Kieran, welcome to Econ Talk. Uh, thanks for having me. This is a short, lovely book on midlife crisis, but it's really about the nature of life and death and what philosophy has to say about all those things, and it's fabulous. Uh, so we're going to start with, what is the midlife crisis? Is it a real thing, or is it just something made up? Good question, and I think that the jury is still out to some extent. So the, the sort of, it, it, unlike a lot of cultural tropes, it has a definite point of origin, which is this 1965 essay by a Canadian psychoanalyst, Elliot Jacques, called Death and the Midlife Crisis. That's where the phrase comes from. The stereotype sort of that we now sort of are familiar with really picks up in the 70s. Then there was a wave of research by medical sociologists and psychologists and others around 2000 debunking the idea of the midlife crisis. And then the idea kind of got a new lease on life in around 2008, the 2010s, when economists working on well-being, happiness, started doing these sort of uh, longitudinal studies or lifetime studies in which they found that around the world, for men and women, life satisfaction, overall life satisfaction, seems to take the shape of a kind of gently curving U. So it starts high in youth, it bottoms out, varies around the world, but roughly in your 40s, and then rises again in older age. And while it's a kind of gentle curve, it is significant in that the, the sort of drop in life satisfaction is equivalent to that associated with losing your job or getting a divorce. So maybe not crisis for that many people, but there is some evidence that midlife is a period of unusual malaise. And, and how old are you, Karen? I am uh, 46, so I'm, I'm right in the sweet spot. And your book has a lot of personal uh, thoughts on your own demeanor and well-being, which are quite interesting, I should say. I'm uh, 67, I think. I've, I've lost track. It's fascinating. It's never happened it's before. Probably for the best, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it could be dementia. I'm hoping not. But um, I think I'm much happier than you. So I, it's okay. interesting. <laughs> Even though okay, I, don't believe, I don't believe in... in um, you can compare happinesses, but I don't think I'm suffering for the midlife crisis, and I do seem to be on the upward part of that, the right-hand uh, tail of the U. I seem, I'm happier okay. than I was uh, 20 years ago, at least, so that, that uh, that's interesting. Now, you write, quote, the issues I have addressed apply to almost anyone, not just a privileged few. We all face loss and limitation, roads not taken, chances missed. We make mistakes, survive misfortunes, see our efforts fail, and in the end, we die. Now, the book's a lot cheerier than that. Why, <laughs> why did you write it in, uh, in that way, that, um, that sort of cheerless way? Oh, well, why did I open that way? I mean, well, I, I that, think that's it's actually, oh, it's actually from the end of the book, I think. Oh, is it? Okay, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, there you go. That goes my, that's my, my, uh, my um, senior moment of not remembering my own book. I mean, I, I, I think that the part of it is I think that the, the mid midlife is kind of a funny thing to take on as a philosopher, because on the one hand, part of why I embraced the midlife crisis label was that it's sort of funny and it's self-mocking. On the other hand, I think a lot of the issues that are preoccupying people around mid midlife are really quite profound issues about the temporality of human life. And they do relate to mortality, the, the sort of inevitability of failure, the inevitability of regret, and the kind of profound existential questions, really, about the, our relationship to time as we age. And so uh, I wanted to both address those serious issues and do it in a way that was slightly lighthearted. And the book, you know, it's on the one hand, I, I bill it as a self-help book. On the other hand, part of that was just the fun of sort of framing a philosophy book under the, under the sort of structures and constraints of self-help, sort of forcing myself to try to think about how philosophy could in fact be useful for someone in the situation I was in. And partly that was because I had found it useful myself going through, I mean, I genuinely went through a period of pretty serious malaise it was mostly career focused, but in my sort of mid thirties, kind of, I was a, an early adopter, had a feeling that I'd sort of made it to the point I had struggled for 
20 years, 15 years to reach. And that I couldn't, I hadn't got a plan that went beyond that. And that what I was doing seemed hollow somehow. And that was a genuine kind of crisis for me. And also one that I found philosophically challenging because I was doing exactly what I thought was worth doing. And I was relatively successful. And yet at the same time, I thought something is deeply wrong with my life. And that's puzzling. What could it be? What's ro- what could be wrong with your life if you're actually doing things that are, are, are kind of worthwhile and outwardly it's going going well? And, and you start early on in the book, you refer to um, John Stuart Mill confronting the feeling that if he had achieved everything he had hoped for, his deepest desires, um, he would not be happy. And this is a paradox. You spend quite a bit of time talking about it. So let's start with that. Surely, one would think that if you get what you want, what could be better? Yeah. So this is in a way that the there are some parts of the book that are sort of backward looking and about regret and failure. But there's also a part that's about this sort of puzzle of how it can be that even success can seem like failure. And, you know, I was an early adopter at 35. Mill had his his crisis when he was 20. So he was uh, he was precocious in this as in all things. And for Mill, I think the the, the way I diagnose it, he, he, he himself, it's interesting that in his autobiography, he offers a kind of philosophical self-diagnosis. And part of his self-diagnosis is about the idea that it gets called the paradox of egoism, that directly pursuing your own happiness can be self-undermining, which is an interesting idea, although kind of a bad fit for Mill, since I think what was going on him with him was in some ways the opposite of that, which is that he had absorbed the idea that what mattered, the only thing that mattered was to reduce human suffering. And there's a way in which that human reducing human suffering is intrinsically valuable. I mean, even if it had no further effect, even if nothing else came of it, reducing someone's suffering would be worthwhile. So it's not that it's just instrumentally valuable, like money or some pursuing wealth or something. It's it's genuinely valuable in itself, but nevertheless, there is something limited about it. And one way to bring that out is to think it, about the fact that it's sort of ameliorative. Like the value of reducing suffering is the value of taking away something bad. It's sort of solving a problem or meeting a need that really it would be better off if we didn't actually have to deal with. So, in a way, what you're doing is taking away bad things. And if that's the best you could do, it seems like the most you could hope for would be to sort of make life not bad, which is to say, sort of reach some kind of zero level. And it wouldn't be positively good. And I think Mill's problem was that he hadn't really, at that point in his life, conceptualized what kinds of things in life would be good and valuable that weren't a matter of problem solving. And in the book, I call this existential value because It is the kind of thing that makes life worth living in the first place, that makes it possible to have a life in principle that is positively good, not just not bad because we've solved the problems in it. And that, you know, that's my diagnosis of Mill. I think his version of it was radical in a way that's often illustrative. It's helpful to take these kind of extreme cases of someone whose life was entirely and wholly devoted to relieving suffering. But I think you do get versions of that on a more mundane level around midlife that problem solving with your kids, with your aging parents at work can start to occupy more and more and more of your life. And you kind of lose touch with the things that have existential value, the things that make it positively worthwhile to live life at all, because there's so much attention devoted to just keeping things together. So give us some examples of what you mean by existential value. It's a really beautiful distinction, by the way, which i I've never seen. I, I've never thought about it. I found it quite uh, thought-provoking. So on the one hand, you have problem-solving, uh, reducing of suffering, but there's something else on the upside. What is it? Well, I, I so for Mill, it was reading Wordsworth's poetry. It was the contemplation of nature and nature through art. And you know, Aristotle has a similar kind of distinction in at the end of the Nicomachean Ethics in Book Ten of the Nicomachean, Nicomachean Ethics. This is where Aristotle suddenly and surprisingly says the life of practical virtue is really second best because it's a problem-solving life. And the thing to go for is contemplation of the structure of the cosmos. 
So there are these highfalutin answers to this question, you know, <laughs> what has existential value? It's contemplating nature, poetry, art, uh, philosophical contemplation. And I think those are good answers. And I think art is actually not that highfalutin an answer. I think art is pretty central to most of our lives. Almost everyone has some kind of form of art that is deeply meaningful to them. But I actually think this phenomenon is much, much broader. There are much more mundane things like going for a swim or joking with friends or you know, having a wonderful dinner, uh, having this conversation, things that are, are uh, a value that are not just solving a problem, but seem sort of positively valuable. The philosopher Zena Hitz has a nice phrase for this in, um, I'm not sure if it's in her book, Lost in Thought, or in some of the essays around the book. She calls these the little human things, like the little things that it, in every day you find a little space for that are forms of, of sort of positive life affirmation. And so I, I think there are these grandiose answers to the question, what has existential value? But there's also a lot of mundane things in life, you know, that, that have that value. Even, you know, hobbies have characteristically that value. They're not about solving problems. They're things that you don't need to do, but you just enjoy. Wasn't meeting Harriet Taylor part of... Sure. That yeah. made <laughs> yeah. life better for Mill, and wouldn't that be... This is his became the love of his life. Uh, isn't that part of what redeems um, daily life is a shared experience with the person you care about? Yeah. So loving relationships are, are, are another good example. And I think there's a kind of very subtle distinction there that I, I think Aristotle is, in my view, kind of shaky on. So I said there's sort of activities that are ameliorative and that they solve problems or meet needs that you'd rather do without. There are also activities that solve problems or meet needs like loneliness or the need for other people, but they're not needs or problems that, as it were, we would rather do without. Sometimes there are needs that we actually think, yeah, I, I do need other people and I don't wish I didn't have that need. So that's something I would count as having existential value. Aristotle, I think, is, is hazy on that, which is why Aristotle has this sort of weird discussion towards the end of the Nicomachean Ethics where Having said that contemplation is the sole thing that has existential value, he's very puzzled about why you need friends or maybe the best life would just be you solely, just solitary contemplation. I, I, I'm with you in thinking that relationships have this kind of positive value, even if they meet needs, because the needs, what, what is the, the, the song? People who need people. Uh, yeah. You know, that, I think there's something to that. Yeah, they're the luckiest people in the world. I th I th I think that's uh, right. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. And that's your everyday way of saying that it's a plus that you have that requirement, that urge. Exactly. Uh, I would just I mentioned that, you know, Zena Hitz is a previous guest on Econ Talk. You can uh, we'll link to her uh, her episode on her book, Lost in Thought. Now, you suggest art is something that um, is existential, has has positive value rather than just reducing negative value. Um, and, and those little human things that Zena talks about, you know, economists would just call those things that produce positive utility. What's interesting is you're claiming that reducing harm is not the same as adding benefit and that therefore they're not commensurable and that commensurability is something we'll, we will definitely, um, come back and talk to. But I want to challenge something you said that seems a little inconsistent. So existential value can lift your spirits in a way you claim that merely reducing suffering doesn't achieve. And yet when you finish a book, uh, which is a great example of existential value, you argue at another part in the book that, that that's a, ultimately a letdown. When it's over, it's like, well, that's done. What's next? Uh, do you think that's true all the time? Don't you get some satisfaction from your books when they're done? Aren't you happy? I yeah, am. Well, so, <laughs> there's a, this is, I don't know if we should get into this now or later. There's this other distinction that, between <laughs> telic and, and atelic activities. So I think these are cross-cutting distinctions. I think they're easy, they're related and they're easy to run together because Aristotle, who is one of my sort of guides here, is obsessed, I think, both with existential value and with what I call atelic activity. So the distinction here is between telic activities that have a, an endpoint at which they're completed, like writing a book or, you know, getting married or having kids, like you, you strive towards it and at a certain point you're done. And atelic activities are ones that don't have a built-in built in endpoint like that, like going for a walk or parenting or spending time with friends. 
and it kind of cross cuts with um, ameliorative and existential. So there are things that have existential value that are telic, like writing a book maybe, or uh, producing a piece of art or um, playing a game with a friend. It will end. You're done. You finished the, the board game or whatever. That was telic. And so I think there's a problem both with lives that are too consumed by ameliorative value and don't have room for this sort of existential value that's positively good. But then there's a further problem, which is the problem that when you've got, when you're in, focused on telic activities, think of them as projects, what you're doing is sort of aimed at a completion. You're not there yet. And then the moment you're there, it's done, it's over. And what you're doing when you engage with it is in a way trying to finish it. So you're taking this thing that's meaningful to you and what you're in effect trying to do is destroy it. You're trying to say, let's get that out of my life. Let's get that done. And there's something self undermining about that. And it's not that T Lake activities or projects or achievements don't have value, but that if you're exclusively focused on them, there's a kind of thing you're missing, which is the, the value of the, the process. So there's lots more to say about that. Let me try to connect it to the specific point you made about when you finished a book. So I think, suppose you're writing a book. I think the writing of the book is a project. It will be finished. You'll be done. It will be over. But then there are atelic activities associated with achievements. So there are things like reflecting on your life or thinking back over what you've done in a kind of ruminative, appreciative way. That is an atelic activity. There's not a kind of particular endpoint to which you've exhausted that. You can sit and reminisce as long as you like. So I think what's happening there is that you've sort of, you springboard from a completed telic activity to find an associated activity that is in fact atelic and that does have value, namely sort of reminiscing afterwards about the great moments in your life, you know, looking back on them. And so I do think, yes, you can find value in that. And I think that is, that sort of, consistent with the idea that there's a kind of limitation in in projects so the telic and atelic i assume come from teal teal is goal t-e-l yes. right so yeah just to help listeners who haven't read the book yet yet yes. um help with the with the with the terminology. So Telic has a goal. I'm going to finish the book. Atelic, meaning A, meaning not, it doesn't have a goal. It's just the process. I'm in the middle of it. So an atelic part of finishing the book is is the joy of writing when you're in the, you know, it's sometimes called flow and, and just ideas are coming forth and you think of something you haven't thought of before. And it's, it's, ex, it's literally exhilarating when, when it's done well, or you realize you can get this John Stuart Mill thing about his, his words worth into the, into this book you're writing and you get, you get excited and you tell people about it and it's fun. And, um, but the part I'm, I'm kind of puzzled about is you gave three examples, marriage, having a child and, and writing a book as things that are telic, but of course, all of them, continue on as long as you're alive, right? Your marriage doesn't end once you, on your wedding day and right. your parenting doesn't end. You, you mentioned parenting, but yeah, yeah. having children is, is most people would say it's not just the having, it's the whole journey right. going forward. Right. And even writing a book, you know, writer, people who read it write you and tell you're an idiot. No, I mean, they tell you how much they like it if we're lucky. <laughs> and yes. it's, um, and it actually, and I, this comes up later and we'll get to it, but so many things for me, and maybe this is not a healthy thing, but so many things for me are, are you, you mentioned, you used the word ruminative. You, you ruminate on them. You think back, yeah, that was, that was good. I enjoyed that. That was important. That was satisfying. There are things we savor. You know, uh, there's a great line from Woody Allen. He says he's trying to decide whether to get a divorce or, um, or go on vacation. And he says, um, he says, oh, well, he decides to go for the divorce because the vacation's over after a couple of weeks, but the divorce you have forever. <laughs> and, and I've always thought that it's a total misunderstanding. It's funny, but yeah. it's a total misunderstanding of why we go on vacation. We don't just go on vacation for the, the 10 days, two weeks, four days, whatever it is that we're experiencing a new place and new, new museums and, and meals and so on with a, ideally with someone we, we care about. But it's the memories, you know, it's reflecting on them. It's, it's going back and saying, remember that jazz club in Paris? That was so much fun. And so a lot of that pleasure is not short-lived. You know, I, I would make a contrast between 
as an economist, we don't do this. I think it's a, in a way it's a mistake between eating ice cream, which I enjoy tremendously in the moment, and it's over, and I look back on it with kind of horror sometimes <laughs> because because it's not – I don't have any memories about the ice cream. But what I do have are memories about looking out over from the veranda where my wife and I were having dessert, and that's a totally different thing. So I think everything you said seems seems totally right to me. I think that part of what's going on here is that telic and atelic activities, and I'm probably guilty of this sometimes, I, that it, sa- it can sound as though you're either doing one or the other. But actually, anytime we're doing anything, we're almost, with, with very rare exceptions, doing both. So, you know, when I'm rushing my kids to school in the morning, I am also parenting. So I've got this telic activity, atelic activity, I'm doing both. So the idea that can't be do sort of, a telic activities rather than telic activities. It's about which ones your value. So where, where your evaluative focus is. So I think in the cases you're describing, getting married, like having the wedding, signing on the signing the documents, that's a telic activity. But it's obviously associated with this, this other thing, namely being married, having an ongoing relationship of marriage with someone, which is a telic. Similarly, having a kid. It, you know, there's a birth date, it happens, there's an event, but it's associated with this ongoing atelic activity. And similarly, I think that's the other thing you're pointing to is that lots of things that, that are uh, finished, like going on vacation, they, they do sort of sponsor later atelic activities that are very significant, namely uh, reminiscing often with someone else about sort of the past relationship. So the, the argument I'm making is not so much it's not that telic activities don't have value. And it's not even that you should stop engaging with them and engaging a, a telic activities instead, because that wouldn't really make sense. It's that there's a, the, the risk of a certain kind of midlife crisis is this sort of type A investment where the only thing you're really valuing is the projects. It's just sort of getting one thing after another done, checking them off the list and moving on to the next one. And if that's how you're living, then you're really missing something. And what you're missing is the kind of reorientation of focus that you're, you're describing. And, you know, I mean, one way to just sort of make this personal for me is I think, you know, thinking about philosophy, thinking about philosophical questions, talking about them, those are atelic activities. Engaging in philosophy was this thing that I loved as a teenager. And then I kind of got channeled into doing it professionally. Don't regret that. That was good. I've been very fortunate to be able to do it but there is a way in which the structure of academia, like the structure of many professions, sort of channels you into becoming more and more and more focused on these telic things, namely finish your PhD, get tenure, get an article into fill review if you can, get a, you know, teach the next class, teach this grad seminar, apply for this grant. And you start to find, at least there's a risk, and if it happened to me, that you that you're actually getting almost exclusively diverted into focusing on the telic activities, the projects, and you're losing touch with the fact that in a way, the point of engaging in this, all this, in all these projects is to be doing philosophy, is to be reflecting on these questions. And that was the thing that I think I had really become detached from and had to really sort of struggle to recover around, around this sort of my, my early midlife crisis. I think that's actually incredibly um, profound. I, the, the natural impulse we have to focus on the telic, to focus on the project, to focus on the next deal, the next book, the next grant, the next, and then you forget what it's for. And not just you forget what it's for, you forget day to day to savor the parts of it that are important, meaningful, joyous, exuberant, whatever. The other part that's hard is the the project itself becomes the the goal. The the whole purposiveness of your day-to-day life becomes looking ahead. So the the ability to enjoy the moment, the ability to enjoy day-to-day life. So if you're not careful, you're always in the past either reminiscing or regretting. And we'll come to regret in a minute because we're, we're going to talk about your, your personal problems in a second. Karen, <laughs> don't, don't, don't worry. Okay, good. But it good. seems to me that, that the other side of it is, is, is the impulse to always look forward. That, that, oh yeah, I'll be happy 
I'll have enough tomorrow. I'll have enough articles tomorrow. Sure, I don't spend enough time with my kids. But that's because I'm, I'm, I'm accumulating. I'm going to get tenure. I'm accumulating all these, these uh, goals along the way in my professional life as an academic or if you're in business until, you know, I got to get this next deal and, and I, I got to work up late and stay late and, you know, and so on. And I, I work over the weekend. Yeah, I miss the little league game, but, but the kids, it'll, it'll be okay for them because they need to go to college. You know, you find all these rationalizations and what's happened is that you've become possessed <laughs> by the goal itself rather than by reminding yourself you're living. And so you're either living exclusively in the past or in the future, and you're missing day to day. And then you find out life's over and you missed it. And that if you notice it too late, you do, you're do you going to have a heck of a midlife crisis. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's sort of two things come to mind here. One is there's this paradoxical sounding slogan that Dostoevsky has, which is, it's not about happiness, but the pursuit of happiness. And there's something to that, that, that if what you're thinking is there's this future state I'll get to, then I'll be happy. You're, you're in for a, a fall because it, it, you're sort of aiming at a kind of project like structure in which if you've structured it as a project, the moment you achieve it, it's done. So not only are you now sort of pained by the fact that you don't have it, once you've got it, it's gone. And this is sort of, you know, the other thing that comes to mind is Schopenhauer on the futility of desire, which I talk about in, in the book that he he thinks this is sort of endemic to the structure of human desire. And there's no really no way out. And I, I argue that it's because he doesn't really conceptualize atelic activities. But his thought is, yeah, when you, you if you don't desire things, you've got nothing to do. Life is empty. But the moment you want something, you've got to want something you don't have. And that's painful. So you're always looking to the future and you're kind of doomed. And I think what he's missing is that when you're engaging, when you value an atelic activity, like having a conversation with someone about philosophy, there's no more, it, it's happening right now. There's nothing more to, to what you want than this, this very thing. And so it doesn't have, atelic activities don't have this problem that they're just always pointing to you, pointing you towards a future that's sort of deferred and then immediately archived. And I think that is something we're, we're very prone to, to miss. But I do think part of it is this difference between ice cream and a great conversation, which is that I'm enjoying this conversation right now. And it is going to come to an end, though. Yes. It's going to, it's going to end, and I'm going to say, well, I wish we could have talked longer. But, you know, it, we had to finally end it. Now, I can say, well, but we'll talk again about his next book. But that's not the point. The point is that... I can enjoy this conversation. I will enjoy this conversation going forward because things will be – I'll remember things from it. So, somebody will see some, hear something in it that I didn't hear the first time. I'll learn something I didn't know. Those are the – that's why it's so rich. It's not, it's not so much the ending, which is the ice cream comes to an end. When the ice cream comes to an end, it's remarkably unsatisfying. And you think, well, why was I doing – why was I eating that? I was like impul compulsively eating it, yeah. and yet compulsively having a conversation is is wonderful. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, I think it, in in the case of something like your, I was about to say project. I, maybe I shouldn't call it a project. I mean, <laughs> the part of what what you what's happening is, on the one hand, you, you've got a project to record a podcast what every week, yeah. so it's it's constantly structured by goals that have to be met that require planning and organization and telic focus. On the other hand, there's a way in which the point is to be having interesting conversations or at least conversations with people about interesting topics. And that is sort of just a kind of thread that runs through the entire sort of strings through all the projects. And in a way, the point of having all the particular conversations is to be reflectively engaging with other people and sharing it with your audience and so on. And so, yeah, no, I think that's exactly the, the way I'm, I'm thinking about it. And I think this is a good example because it again brings out that it's not an either or situation. So people, when, when I valorize atelic activities that don't have end goals, it, it, sometimes people ask, well, are you saying we should sort of give up on being ambitious and just kick back and relax? Right. And the answer is no, it, it doesn't involve that at all. You could be driven to produce a successful podcast and record every week. And it could be a, a relentless sort of project of hard work in which you have to keep focused. Nevertheless, the question is, you, you can still ask yourself, what am I getting? What, where's the value of this? 
And the question can still arise, is it purely in checking the boxes or is there a value in the atelic ongoing interaction here? And so I, I think you, you can make this shift without sort of deciding to give up on projects. It's about how you relate to them. Which is weird, right? Because often we don't have a choice in how we relate to things. And I, one of the things I That's loved true. about your book is that uh, you don't you don't pretend that you have a magic formula. And sometimes what the formula you do have means thinking about something differently than you thought about it before. And part of that inevitably fails. Uh, if I, you know, I get anxious on the way to the airport and my wife can say to me as many times as she'd like, but you never miss a flight. And so why are you so anxious? And you know, there's no traffic and you know, we've got plenty of time. Why are you anxious? And I, it, it'd be lovely to say, yes, it's irrational <laughs> for me to be nervous. So I won't yeah. be anymore. It doesn't yeah. often work that way. Uh, but I do think writing like yours and you write beautifully, writing like yours reminds you to be aware of it. It, it may not solve it. In, in a couple of cases, you give examples of how you might play a, I think you call it cognitive therapy. So cognitive therapy doesn't always work, but sometimes it does. And the right. reason it does is it's like saying, hey, knock it on the side of your head. Wake up. There's something else you can think about. Try it. And maybe you can sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, this is part of, I mean, this is something I've thought about a lot, continued to think about since writing this book about the question, how can philosophy help? And one kind of answer, I think not the only kind of answer, is exactly that it, it's a kind of philosophical cognitive therapy. And this is kind of an idea that, I mean, cognitive therapy itself goes back to stoic thinking about the emotions. But whereas a sort of prototypical ordinary cognitive therapy might focus on your mistaken beliefs about whether other people like you or why your mother did what she did or something. What I'm focusing on are mistaken beliefs about how you relate to time or where the value of your activities lies. And I think you're right that sometimes the cognitive correction by itself can make a significant difference. And in some cases that that was true of me. In others, you're right. There's a kind of, you can make the cognitive shift and then the affective uh, follow through <laughs> is not immediately forthcoming. I mean, that was certainly, that was true of me in that I think it really is being too project focused. That is my besetting vice, at least when it comes to having a midlife crisis. And I think recognizing that was important. I don't think I would have got very far with my own midlife crisis without recognizing that. On the other hand, simply recognizing it is not enough. So you can say to yourself, as I said to myself, remember, you love doing philosophy just as an atelic activity. Not just, it's not about getting the next article into print or whether you get two articles finished this summer or only one, or you don't get anything finished. It's not, that's not the right way to focus. But once you've been trained for 20 years in academia to focus on getting things done, you can't just switch off. And so I do think there's a, there's a challenge there. And we could, I mean, for me, a certain kind of med mindfulness meditation has been helpful in, in, this goes back to something you said about not looking to the future, just sort of trying to give up on and get away from asking what will come of this? Where is it going? What will it achieve? And I've, I have found that helpful, but I think there's, there's also a lot of kind of structural problems here that in the book, I don't talk about so much. In the new book, I talk more about the way in which there are kind of social pressures and cultural pressures to be achievement oriented. And those also, you can't just opt out of. It's not just coming from us. It's coming from the way in which we're valued by other people and the way in which we're shaped by, you know, economic activity, professional activity, those kinds of things. Our sense of pride and dignity often comes from how other people view us and right. that can that can be challenged. I was going to ask you actually about the role of of culture. You actually you said something as uh, 25 seconds ago, something like, yeah, wait, there's so much emphasis on getting things done. Yeah. Well, a lot of people say, but that's the whole goal of life. The whole goal of life is to accumulate either money or happiness or just come on multitask that's why you have to multitask yeah, and yeah. Do, do you have any life hacks for me and, and you know my new book wild problems I, I point out that that's just it's a terrible way to live it's really yes. not it's not <laughs> right. but, but yet i think so much of our culture 
pushes us in that direction toward um, what I call optimizing, and and which yeah. is the economist, literally the economist model of human behavior. You optimize right. your happiness. You do, but you maximize your happiness subject to constraints. You're always looking for the optimal this, the optimal that, the best buy, the best spouse, the best child raising technique, the best movie you can watch tonight. And some of those things is not a bad idea to try to find a movie you're going to like, the movie you're not going to like. But this whole yeah. idea of, of 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 maximization, which is the credo of my training, yeah. is I think leads us badly astray. Yeah. I mean, I I think the so I I agree with that, and I think one way to to sort of bring out, I mean, one of the formulas that sort of made me made my midlife crisis vivid to me was related to this, which was the thought, I want to max out my productivity. So how many articles I could I could you know if, if in my career I could write forty articles, but if I work really hard, it could be forty one or forty two or forty three or hold on. This the, this is just an open-ended upward thing. And no matter where it goes, there's always another one I could have done if I'd sacrificed a bit more of other things. And the thought, I think you could think, right, the challenge here is just to figure out what is the optimal number of articles in a career, given that you also want to optimize your relationships and your family and what, other things. But there's also the I, the thought something is... I'm compelled by the thought that something is confused about this way of approaching life. Um, and in a way, for me, I think insofar as, you know, it's death and the midlife crisis, I don't think, I don't think I really got anywhere with my fear of death. I remain terrified of death. But the thing that death made vivid to me was this sense that it's going to be a finite number. And the difference between <laughs> of, of articles and the difference between a career where it's 72 and a career where it's 81 is actually, once I think of it in those terms, it's pretty clear to me that that is not important to me, even though in the moment it can seem like that's where I should be focusing my, my energy. Yeah, and my claim is that you're sitting around thinking, well, what would the optimal number be given that I care about my spouse or my children or my ability to play the flute or master a different language? And the problem isn't just that that's hard to do. It's actually impossible. But the harder problem is your brain is not going to let you evaluate that in an objective way. You're going to think it is. But in fact, your ego is is working away saying, 80 is not enough. You need 90. So, yeah, you could still get by. You can still, you, you know, okay, you won't spend as much time with your kids, but it'll be quality time. So it won't be quantity time. Or, oh, my spouse will understand. She knows this. Is, I really need this because otherwise I'll be kind of grouchy around the house because I won't have published enough this year. And there's so many ways you can rationalize yeah, yeah. pursuing a set of of, of TLIC goals that, that are projects that are uh, actually not good for you. And yes. uh, are yep. leading you astray. So I'm open to the possibility. I mean, I don't have any problem with. Um, uh, I, I can't judge Steve Jobs. I, you know, he wasn't. Maybe he was not the best father. There, there's some evidence that that is the case. But I, uh, who knows? It's really hard to be a father. I don't, I'm not going to judge him on that at all, actually. But. The, I'm really glad he spent a lot of time on Apple. It was nice. I'm, it made my life a little better. And he put, as he would say, a dent in the universe. There are some people who should spend time denting the universe. Uh, great scientists, great artists, and so on. But but as we look into our own souls, I mean, it's so easy to convince yourself that what's good for some higher purpose is actually just good for you, really, or your own crazy needs that are due to the fact the way your your mother treated you or whatever it is. Yeah. I mean, this is something I, I don't talk about in, in midlife so much. I do a bit more in, in the new book, which, which is the way in which uh, a kind of an element of the midlife crisis, but also this kind of distortion you're talking about has to do with uh, um, sort of positional assessment or comparative assessment. So there's one of the problems with the kind of how many articles metric is that it it's very naturally allied to competition, to sort of thinking well, what are my peers doing? And where do I want to rank myself alongside them? And those, it's not that those are never worth caring about or that it's always misguided. And sometimes it's instrumentally useful. Sometimes you can leverage your own competitiveness to get yourself to do things and you can sort of strategically exploit it. 
But in itself, it's it's very often a way of allowing your sense of what's valuable in your own life to be determined by how you think other people are going to perceive you. And in general, it's it's uh, both unreliable. People are mostly not thinking about you at all. But also, um, it's it you know it, there's a kind of inauthenticity and a lack of autonomy to it. I mean, so going back to John Stuart Mill again, something that I don't I mentioned in the book, but don't dwell on is I mean, surely one of his problems was he was brought up in this hot house way by his father to be a kind of utilitarian machine. And one problem was it's all just about reducing suffering. Where's the positive value? Another problem that he had in some way to kind of come to terms with was his life plan had been decided on by someone other than him. And he had to kind of decide, am I going to own this? And in what form can I decide that this is my project? As opposed to just thinking, I've been designed by James Mill as a kind of utility maximizing instrument. And so that there, again, in Mill's case, it's an extreme version of having your values determined from outside. For all of us, that's something we grapple with, and it's extremely difficult and raises kind of deep philosophical issues because there's a way in which the idea of inventing your values from scratch without any input from anyone else is kind of a fantasy. Like in some way or other, it's true. A, acculturation into values is part of the best case scenario, and the challenge is to figure out when is this going well and when is it a matter of cultural values that are kind of toxic or in some way or other oppressive to me. And there isn't a kind of formula for that. There isn't a kind of formal test from whether it's coming from you or outside, but it is a kind of thing that people have to struggle with. And you might struggle with that around midlife. I think a lot of people struggle with that around the kind of quarter life crisis where they're thinking, I've got to separate from my parents, for instance, and to think, what is my path in life? And yeah, I, I think that's another part of kind of grappling with our own well-being and our own kind of vision of living well that midlife can can make vivid. Well, occasionally on this program, I talk about Homer and how much I like the Odyssey. And I'd love to read it in the original Greek. Um, I can't read any Greek. And yet lucky John Stuart Mill learned it at three. Yeah. And right. yet that wasn't that was a mixed blessing true he could appreciate the odyssey in the original but at 18 he could not have said you know i wish i spent more time playing stickball uh right. and less time right. learning greek or more time becoming a normal human being with an ability to relate to the people around me which he struggled with in fact why isn't his life the best indictment of utilitarianism <laughs> ever made i mean i yeah I've become increasingly hostile to utilitarianism. We did a recent episode, hasn't aired yet, with um, uh, Will McCaskill on uh, what we owe the future. And you wrote a recent review of it. We'll, uh, yeah. we'll put a link up to that. But I've become increasingly uh, believe, I increasingly believe that utilitarianism, which is in many ways at the root of the economic economist view of, say, social welfare, I think is, a, is an error. And uh, I'm bringing up John Stuart Mill's biography now, as the, or his autobiography, which he wrote, as my uh, um, what's the word uh, uh, evidence? Evidence? Yeah. What's the word in a, in a courtroom? What number yeah. one? What do they call it? The, yeah. Uh, uh, um, uh, exhibit. Episode. Exhibit A. Ex yeah. Exhibit Ex Exhibit yeah. A. Yeah. Yeah. I'm making John Stuart Mill's autobiography yeah. Exhibit A. Yeah, I mean there is yes, there's something. There's something kind of amazing about the literalism with which his father, James Mill, took over Bentham's ideas and thought, okay, maximize utility. I'm having a kid. Great opportunity. Let, this, is, this, is, this is a whole life. And there is, you know, there are milder versions of that in sort of Every utilitarian <laughs> concern with spreading utilitarian values. The thought is, well, one of the things you can do is proselytize for utilitarianism and imagine all the people who will then go on to behave in more utilitarian ways. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I mean, I'd be interested to, I'll be very interested to listen to your conversation with, with Will McCaskill. I mean, I think one thing that the effective altruism movement and the kind of new long-termist paradigm has done is to try to say, even if you're not a utilitarian, that's to say you think some degree of partiality to oneself and one's loved ones is permissible. And even if you think we've got to respect people's rights, I mean, the, the kind of pure utilitarian is thinking if you could kill 
you know, a thousand people to save 2000, go ahead and do it. So long as there are no other bad consequences, the kind of newfangled effective altruists are much more circumspect about that kind of thing. But still though, they say, you know, there is a part of life in which you should be ruthlessly maximizing, namely altruism. And even there, I think it's a very complicated issue in part for a reason that you alluded to earlier, which is the incommensurability of value. So I think once you're thinking there are just different kinds of values that are not measurable on a single scale, the idea of maximizing value in your altruistic endeavors looks complicated. When you're dealing with the same metric, if you could you know, save a thousand people from malaria or 2000, okay, save 2000. But when you're thinking about malaria versus, um, you know, charities that that uh, bring arts education to kids who otherwise couldn't have get arts education, the idea of a single metric where you can evaluate these things is, I think, uh, an illusion. And so I think it's very complicated. And so uh, there's a way in which the effective altruist mantra of, of you know, do the most good is hot, very, very hard to apply in practice. Well, to pick on another example that I don't care for, Peter Singer says I should feel guilty throwing a birthday party for my child, which of course is a remarkably extravagant event compared to the lives of people, say, in the bottom billion. And he yeah. argues we should therefore, I should take that money. I shouldn't throw the birthday party. I should instead give it to fight malaria or, or deworming or something that, that they've allegedly measured, I think, imperfectly, but okay. Let's give them their yeah. due for a minute. Uh, enough, um, I can have a, big, a bigger impact on world happiness. As, and, as, and there's an assumption, there's a, there's a commensurability there. But there's actually a more insidious, I haven't thought about it before. Not only should you not throw your kid's birthday party, you should stay late at the office because you're going to have more money to give to charity. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you become then a tool. You become an, a, 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 an object of – you're a serf, actually, for the well-being of others. Now, I'm a big fan of altruism. I'm a big fan of, of, of tithing. I, I try to give 10% of my uh, after-tax income to charity. And I love the effect of altruism's emphasis that it's not just the giving, it should have an impact. And I don't, I think there are many good things that have come out of the movement. Yeah. But the idea that, that there's this metric of world happiness that I'm morally obligated to fulfill is, is really endorsing slavery. He said, not exaggerating at all with hyperbole, but okay, <laughs> a little bit yeah. perhaps, but there's some truth to it, I think. Well, I, yeah, slavery is hyperbole, but it's a bit like the, it is, it is kind of the modern version on a smaller scale of the John Stuart Mill paradigm, namely, how could your life make the most difference to 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 the greater happiness? I mean, yeah, it, it will be a longer conversation to really kind of think through exactly what's right and what's wrong with effective altruism. Because I agree with you that ma many of the you know, some charities are ineffective and the money is being wasted, and this is a very big problem. And having people give some percentage of their income, there's nothing bad about that in itself. I do think there there are some you know counterintuitive features of effective altruism. So one of the the, the argument that's in the vein of, of what you're describing is the argument that you might think, say, the effective altruist that you might think working for an NGO is the thing to do. But actually, if you can work for a hedge fund, right? You, the chances are, if you don't work for the NGO, someone else will. But the chances that the next hedge fund guy will make as much money and give as much of it to charity as you would, much, much lower. So the the impact of devoting yourself to a job you don't like to make lots of money is much, much greater. That's kind of counterintuitive. And, you know, the, there's, I think, the, you know, that there's, something John Stuart Mill like uh, about that you're, that you're, you're pointing out about the kind of life path that's being envisaged there. Okay. Let's shift gears. Let's, sure. um, I want to get to regret and um, fear of missing out or looking back on and regretting missing out. And I think it's there's some interesting parallels to economics, but let's start with your uh, life path. You in the book talk about the fact that when you were younger, you thought about being a poet, you thought about being a doctor and you became eh, 
a philosopher <laughs> and you look back yes. on it now and think, mm, did I do the right thing? And does that torment you? And how should you deal with it? Process it. Talk about that. Yeah. So, so I think it's very closely related to the issues of commensurability we've been describing because I, I think you know, I take my own example partly because it's ready to hand, partly because it's so simple. Like, I, I really did have this sort of idea at 16 or 17 that I should pick a vocation. And my dad wanted me to be a doctor. I had been really devoted to poetry. I mean, I was really, I'd written a lot of embarrassing poetry as a teenager and some not so embarrassing poetry as a teenager. But I was falling in love with philosophy and I went off to do philosophy and I've been very fortunate. But what I experience now, and I think this is something many people will will relate to, is even when things have gone pretty well, it's still possible to experience regret, sometimes intense regret in the kind of in a kind of nostalgia form for all the things you didn't get to do, the the band you never started, the person who you dated, who you could have stayed with, and you didn't, and now you're with someone else who you really love, but it's hard not to recognize that there was another life you might have had. And I think part of what that is a function of is precisely the incommensurability of values. It's precisely a function of value pluralism. So, you know, the way I put this in the book is that, you know, there are cases where you make a choice and it will be bizarre to regret the choice. So someone says, do you want 50 bucks or a hundred? You think, is there some trick here? No. Then you take the hundred bucks and you don't afterwards think, oh, what if I'd taken the 50? Because there is a common currency literally in that case. But most decisions are not like that. Even decisions where you're just picking pleasures. If they're pleasures of different kinds, like the example I have in the book is like going to a party where you've, you've been invited to by someone you just met or going to hear a lecture on an interesting topic that is one night only. And they're both just for fun, but nevertheless, in, on a small scale, you can then experience when you do one of them that there's something, un, there's a kind of uncompensated loss in the other one. So it's FOMO. And a lot of the sense of missing out and nostalgia is basically sort of existential FOMO. It's FOMO writ large. It's the sense that there are whole lives that I've missed out on. And that's just a fact. How to come to terms with that? Well, part of how to come to terms with it, I think, is just recognizing that it's inevitable and that it's a function of something good. Like, again, if you sort of flip to the, the, the opposite, it's helpful. If you think, well, what would it take for me not to face this, this problem of missing out? It would have to be that instead of a diversity of different things worth valuing, all of which I appreciate, it was all just like kind of a homogenous buzz of pleasure where there's a single currency of it. And the only question is, how much did you get? So in other words, the only way life could avoid missing out is if it was tremendously impoverished, as if there, there weren't this diversity of things worth wanting, or you just weren't able to appreciate them. And on balance, that is a very kind of dystopian vision. The vision of a single currency is kind of bland flattening of the evaluative landscape. So there isn't, as it were, a solution here to missing out. The thought is you're going to miss out, but it's a function of something that is in one way disappointing, but in another way and overall not regrettable, namely value pluralism, the richness of value in, in the world. Okay, so that's about cases of missing out where you don't think this was really bad, I really regret this. That It's a harder problem when you get to cases where you think no, this was just a mistake. This was a misfortune. Something just went terribly wrong. And well, we could talk about that 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 too. I think that that's that's a harder case to come to terms with. Yeah, this is um, this is the grass would have been greener problem. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but if I'd yeah. only made that decision, chosen that path, um, I think the way you, I think it's mainly a philosopher's. Um, problem and a philosopher's solution for some people. I think many people are good at not looking back. They just yeah. sort of, they don't think about it. Yeah. They're yeah. leading the unexamined life and it's working well for them and just leave them alone. Okay. And you yeah. a couple of times say, don't close the book. Don't yeah. Read. Yeah. No, I, I, I don't, I'm not opposed to that. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but, but the idea it's again, comes back to this cognitive idea that, that I can, I can find, 
uh, Sucre, I don't know how to pronounce it, Sucre, Sucre, comfort, solace from the idea that, which I love this idea. I just love this idea. Again, as an economist, we tend to go the other way, but this idea that you actually can't make this trade-off most of the time in life. It's not really, you're not making a trade-off. You have to make a choice. You're not really saying, well, I'm giving that up, but this is worth more than that. You're saying, I'm giving this up and I don't get that. And I don't get that. That's the end of the story. I don't get it. I don't get to enjoy it. And it's, I'll never have that chance again, whether it's the woman you dated, the lecture you missed, the career you didn't pursue. And, uh, but to recognize that that very fact underlies what makes life in many ways worth living. I mean, uh, it certainly is. It, I, I can't know what animals feel, but I have to, I have to assume that, that the, the variance in the kinds of pleasures we have from ice cream to deep love to the sunset that, that we'll never forget and so on. I, it's so much of what makes life rich and wonderful. And to, the only way to really avoid that is to not have that. We wouldn't want that. So we should right. be able to talk yeah. ourselves into not being bad, feeling bad that the grass would have been greener. No, no, exactly. I mean, Plato has a lovely line about this or, you know, Socrates in the, in the Philebus where he, he's talking about hedonism and the idea that there's a single currency of pleasure and describes the like, life of a hedonist as being like the life of a mollusk or a creature living in the sea. Now, again, I don't know exactly what the life experience of a mollusk is, but what we're supposed to imagine is something totally homogenous, just a, just a simple stream of good, bad experiences with no variegation to them at all. And the thought is that is not, that would not be a desirable life for a human being. Yeah, the mollusk is just looking for warm water. And it gets right. a little cold, it moves to the warm water, and that's good. And he's happy. The mollusk is happy. Did, yeah. did, did Bentham not read Plato? Did he not get it, or did he, did he disagree? No, so I, I don't know Bentham as well as I should. I mean, my, my, it's certainly true that the way Bentham is typically interpreted, you know, he, he's, this is a John Stuart Mill paraphrase of Bentham, but he's, the slogan is pushpin, pleasure for pleasure, pushpin is as good as poetry, where pushpin is a, some... Victorian parlor game that's like a trivial activity and poetry is the paradigm, at least for for Mill, of the kind of most profound pleasure. So, I mean, one of the big shifts from Bentham's hedonism to Mill's hedonism is that Mill thinks there's not just differences in quantity of pleasure, but differences in quality. And he has a kind of simplistic seeming theory of this, but the idea is there that even if all you're valuing is pleasure over pain, different kinds of pleasures are not to be measured on a single scale. And so I, I think Bentham did seem to have a very kind of simplistic single currency view. Yeah, that, that there's some amount of push, Ben. Yeah, right, <laughs> exactly, exactly. You. Like how good was the poem? I mean, <laughs> how many hours of push would it take at a certain, you know, exactly. There's something uh, uh, confused about that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, talk about, let's go to the second uh, kind of, uh, regret, which is yeah. you made a choice. It's not, I mean, like your examples, you, you know, poor guy, you're an MIT professor, true to turn the <laughs> philosophy department, yeah. not medical school somewhere. But so you have a good life. You can see it in the book. I'm not giving anything away. Um, but sometimes you make a choice and it turns out badly. What do yeah, you, what's left, I, what do, you I, do then? I wish I'd had the nerve to talk about, about real regrets in the book. What I talk about in the book is my, my periodic feelings of like, really, I should have been a doctor. And I kind of decided not to be a doctor in order to disappoint my father, which is not the best of reasons uh, in retrospect. And, you know, I sometimes think I should have just done it. But, um, and there are other regrets that I could talk about that are more serious, except that I want to, you know, protect the, uh, the, the other parties. So I'm, I, I won't do that. But the, the idea there that, that I found very interesting, although it has limits, is, is this comes from a Derek Parfit thought experiment in which he, uh, argues that sometimes, even when you make a bad decision or something goes wrong, in retrospect, you rationally can and maybe should affirm it. So his example is, or here's an adaptation of his example. Um, You have a temporary condition that means that if you get pregnant now, your child will have some kind of health condition like um, celiac disease or recurrent migraines. If you wait or take some vitamin supplements in a few weeks, it will all be over and you can you can conceive without having that health risk. But you get pregnant now, you go ahead, you have the child. The thought is, you look back and think, well, in one sense, 
that was a mistake. I should have waited. And I don't retract that. But nevertheless, now, do I wish I'd waited? And many people have the response, which seems perfectly reasonable, that actually, I don't wish I'd waited because here I am holding my baby in my arms or my looking at my kid who's now like ah, having another stupid migraine. And I think, well, yeah, I would have had a different kid who didn't have migraines, but little Mary would not even exist. And I don't wish for that. So there's this phenomenon whereby attachment to particular people can rationally switch your preferences so that what you should have preferred back then, you now don't prefer, and what you should have dispreferred back then, you now prefer. So I think that's a real phenomenon. The question is, and that's one way in which you can mute regrets. And I think for parents, this is the thing that I think actually a lot of people do is when they say to them, they say to themselves, the marriage you know, blew up, but if I'd never met whoever it was, I would never have had my daughter or son. And so I can't really regret it, even though there were many painful years and the relationship ended up being a disaster. So I think that's a familiar thought. The question is, how far can you generalize it? And so what I suggest in the book is that there is a kind of broader phenomenon here, which has to do with attachment to the particulars of life. So there's a, a kind of tendency, and I, I think a kind of psychological tendency and maybe a rational psychological tendency to be more strongly moved by all the particular ways in which something is good, to desire or affirm it, even when you know in the abstract that some other outcome would have been better. So even if I think, I'm pretty sure I should have been a doctor, it was a mistake. I think, well, what would that life have been like I guess I would have, I don't know, pulled long hours as a medical resident and talked to patients and saved lives and lost lives. I don't know. It's, it's, I, I've watched ER. I, I have a, yeah, I have a vague, vague vision of what that would be like. And I think that would have been better than being a philosopher. But if I actually think about my life as a philosopher, there are ever so many particular things, like particular students I've known or worked with, particular insights that I've shared with colleagues particular moments of teaching or reading or learning. And I think, would I give all that up for something better that I don't really know and can't even really imagine? And I think that psychologically, it's possible and in fact commonplace to attach to the particulars more than the abstract better alternative. And I suggest more tentatively that that's actually a reasonable sort of structure of preferences, that it's, it's actually reasonable to be more strongly moved by the sort of intricate texture of how life has gone, if it's gone reasonably well, than the abstract consideration that something else would have been better, that we can rationally affirm our lives by just attaching to the particulars of our lives in a way that sort of echoes the way in which you might attach to the particular life of your child although it doesn't literally involve sort of the existence of a valuable thing that, uh, like a child that wouldn't have existed otherwise. It strikes me as kind of a Jedi mind trick that's not really <laughs> um, real. Um, I, oh, let me, let me try something different. The reason I don't like it is that you're Karen, and Karen is, is the is – the, the soup with which all these textural things happen in day-to-day -day life. If you'd been a doctor, you'd have had a bunch of that. You'd have had a huge amount, maybe more, maybe less. There's uncertainty that's yeah. that's unavoidable. Yeah. Could right. have been a horrible doctor. You you could have made a terrible mistake and ruined someone's life and their loved ones, and 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 that would have been horrible. And you could comfort yourself saying you haven't done that, and and you can pretend that that the that those those handful of students that are special or make up for the hundreds of lives you could have saved and the immense amount of satisfaction you could have had from it. Um, and I'm teasing, of course, to some extent. But but I think the it seems to me that the healthier way is to say that was then and this is now. I mean, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with saying I made yeah you know, I, I made a mistake? What what appears to be a mistake, but I can't know and I couldn't know then, uh, and and therefore. 
and this is what I say in, in, in my book, Wild Problems, mm. mistakes in these kind of environments are really bizarre words to use. A bizarre word to use for when you're totally in the dark, you have no idea what life's going to be like, you have no idea what the texture's going to be like. And so you made a leap, and it turned out, okay, maybe it turned out badly, by the way, so that's the case we're talking about. It didn't turn out so well. You didn't get tenure at MIT, you, you ended up at a not so great place, and you weren't happy, and most of your students weren't very good. And But isn't a healthier way to deal with it, just say, well, I can't change the past, or why am I trying to, I'm trying to fix that? Leave it alone. Put it yeah, down. I mean, good question. I mean, good question. I, if, I'm I gonna, would say, if I'm going to pay a mind trick, let's play that <laughs> yeah. one. So I don't object to that at all. It's not that I think you you should spend lots of time thinking about it or that you'd be making a mistake if you just didn't. And I think you're right that a lot of the cases I consider have this sort of philosopher's thought experiment quality where I say, let's stipulate that you know it would have been better. Yeah. And, and realistically, we mostly don't know and we can't know. And so one thing that's going on that I, I do talk about in the book is that there's a kind of risk aversion structure where you think, even at the time, if the gamble would have been better to be a doctor, what I'm looking at now is a pretty good life as a philosopher. And even if I think back then, the gamble would have been better to be a doctor than a philosopher. Looking back, what I'm comparing is not those gambles. It's a pretty good payoff for the second gamble. And who knows what? with the other gamble. So even if the expected value of being a doctor in, you know, 1996 was greater than the expected value of being a philosopher, I'm now comparing the actual value of being a philosopher with a risky thing in the past. So I do think that's an important kind of psychological phenomenon that can, that can make this shift. I mean, I just think, I think there are, there are cases where we, we are in a position to, you know, we know we made a mistake because we we betrayed someone or lied to someone. And we look back and think, I really just should not have done that. I, I knew at the time that it was a stupid thing. To, you know, the, the clearest case would be, I knew at the time that I shouldn't do it. And I went ahead and did it anyway. And there's really no question that I just behaved badly. In cases like that, I think it's very complicated for two reasons. So, so one is there's the, the issue of whether, um, you know, how far affirmation of the particular way your life has gone really works to counterbalance that, whether this attachment to particular thing is real and whether it's rational. There's also a further problem, which is the cases of regret that are most clearly involve identifiable mistakes are ones where the mistake was sort of moral. And there's an extra complication that I think makes it very hard, which is if it's sort of you've messed up your own life, attaching to the particulars of your own actual life and saying, well, look at all the things I do have seems a perfectly okay way to try and reassure yourself. In cases where what you're saying is I made a terrible moral mistake, reassuring yourself by saying, well, look at the particulars of how my life went for me, so it somehow seems to miss the point. So I think that's another case in which I think this, the strategy I'm describing is limited. So in a way, I sort of agree that this strategy has limits. And if you're not thinking about the past in a way that involves regret, you're just thinking that's the past, don't worry about it. You're not making a mistake. It's more that when you do start thinking about the past, apart from just telling yourself, stop doing that, what can you do to, to reframe your relationship to the present? And I think that there is a kind of mistake I'm pointing to, which is the mistake of saying, of sort of when you're in this mode of looking at how your life went and how it could have gone, making abstract comparisons, saying, well, I could have, um, you know, had a great life as a doctor rather than this okay life as a philosopher. I could have, I could have married my childhood sweetheart and I don't know why I was too, you know, afraid to make that commitment then. And now, yeah, my marriage is this. And I think that the, the mistake I'm warning against is the mistake of sort of staying at that abstract level and not exploiting the kind of psychological resource of focusing in on all the particular ways in which your actual life, if pretty good, is good, even if another life would be better. But in a way, it's, it's consonant with your thought that we shouldn't think too much about it. Because one of the corollaries of the idea that knowledge of the particulars and attention to the particulars is a counterweight to regret is that you'll risk undermining this 
both in two ways. One is if you just look at abstract visions of two different lives. The other is if, as well as focusing in on all the particulars of your actual life, you start to imagine in vivid particular detail how much this, how how much better the life would have been. And as soon as you start getting those particulars into view, you'll start sort of, I think, triggering the same psychological mechanism of attachment. So I sort of agree with you in a way that there's a mistake of thinking in too much detail about the alternatives that you've foregone because you risk triggering a kind of regret that is, is at the very least rationally optional. Like you don't need, there's nothing mandatory about thinking in that kind of detail about all the ways your life could have gone. So yeah, why do it? And I'd also add that there's that your brain doing the thing that you're not really in control of that you think it is. The things that come to mind are not always a very full picture of what actually happened or what could have been. And right. it's and it's another reason to say this is not I'm not really I'm only pretending I'm playing back the tape of what my life could have been. In fact, we're prone to both imagining only the good parts and imagine, and then or worse, only focusing on the, the mistakes. And yes. I, I want to try something. I'm going to try a trick I learned from you. Okay. On this problem, I th I think um, never thought about it before, and I really like it. So um, I have four kids, and there are a number of times when I said things to my children I regret. They were said sometimes with um, I was going to say no malice aforethought, um, meaning they were measured. I I, I thought about them. I, I thought about what I wanted to say. The other times I blurted out things and. I've said both of those kind of things to my shame, to my children, and I regret them. Um, I may be the only parent like that, but I suspect <laughs> not. Uh, yes. And so parenting, you know, my joke is it does, they don't, when you come home from the hospital, there's no manual. Really big mistake, actually. Everything else, you get a manual, <laughs> you can scan it, you can find it online. And here's one of the most important things you can do, and there's no guidance. Um, and so you're in the dark. You wander around, you make a thousand mistakes. I, you know, I'm talking about remarks you made. There's 10 other categories of mistakes besides remarks you regret. So that, that hurts me sometimes. I, I have remorse about it and regret and, and pain. But I, I'm now going to use your, one of your cognitive tricks, which is there is no parent who has ever parented perfectly. And there's nothing shameful about blurting out things because it's human. It'd be, it'd be shameful to do it all the time, to say hurtful things to your kids that intentionally, unintentionally, doesn't matter. But the fact that there are some moments that I remember that are not my greatest moments as a father really should not bring me, it does bring me down sometimes, and it shouldn't because it's the human enterprise. It comes back to your point about about the reality of the nature of life. We really wouldn't want to live in a world where it came with the children came with a manual and all you had to do was follow it faithfully and then you could congratulate yourself. So, and the last thought I have on this is that, you know, we just had our first grandchild and a friend of mine said, uh, oh, when, when they were expecting, he said, oh, your, your son's, you know, coming over to your side. I said, what do you mean? who's going to be a parent. He's going to make a lot of mistakes. And <laughs> he's going to find out it's really hard. And and I do think that that's one of the virtues of, of having children, by the way, is to give you a chance to forgive your parents because you realize that all the things they did wrong, it, it's not just, oh, but they did so many things right. That That's not the point. And it's not this sort of a commensurability argument, it, a measurement argument. It's It's that it's the nature of the beast. It's human. It's okay. You should do them on purpose. You try to make them fewer than common, but I think it's okay. I'm sure that's right. I mean, I, I, I'm reminded of, I remember when we, we, we left the hospital with our, our kid. Uh, I remember walking out and thinking, I've never seen doctors behave so irresponsibly. They're letting us walk out with <laughs> exactly. the baby. What are these guys thinking? They, this is just, surely the Hippocratic oath should forbid this kind of Behavior, but no, I, I think you're right. I think, I mean, the, the two things that come to mind in connection with this sort of making mistakes with your kids is one thing that I have got a lot of meaning from is apologizing to my kid, which mm -hmm. is something my father 
Well, actually, recently, <laughs> recently he has started doing a little, but basically <laughs> never did for, you know, for never. 40, 50 years of not apologizing. And I thought it's not that somehow it's better that I made the mistake and apologized than that if I just not made the mistake. On the other hand, it's a, it's a version of this sense that like there's something about the kind of relationship I'm having with my kid that is being made possible by screw ups and that is good. It's not that it was, I should therefore think, hey, it's a net positive that I shouted at my kid completely unreasonably. On the other hand, it's contributing to a kind of relationship that, that I really value. I mean, and the other thing to say about your grandkid is as soon as, as soon as you have the next, the, the grandkid, you can start exploiting the straightforward um, uh, attachment to the existence of a new life. Because, you know, given the butterfly effect, if you hadn't shouted at your, your, at your son or whatever, <laughs> all the little patterns of causality that led to the particular sperm and egg that became your grandchild, they wouldn't even exist otherwise. So you, you should just reassure yourself that had, had you not lost your temper, uh, <laughs> You may have a grandchild, but not this one. And so, oh, you know, that you can now re reaffirm everything, every little thing that happened in the intricate causal history that led to their, their existence. <laughs> At least reaffirm it a little bit. That's awesome. Uh, let's talk about death. Cheerful okay. topic. Um, we all expect to die. None of us really think about it much. I found... There came a year, I don't know when, when it was, but it's in the last few, where I started thinking about my mortality, having almost never thought about it before. Uh, it's an, it is a part of the midlife crisis, as you talk about. What yeah. have you um, learned about death that's been helpful to you? Well, this is, so I, unlike you, I, I think I, I had a, a, a early onset fear of death. And I remember as a kid being, having sort of imagined, just thinking about the fact that I wouldn't exist and having a kind of, electric, terrifying fear, the sort of sense of like shiver down the spine. And I can still, it only takes me 30 seconds of thinking about it and I can get myself back into that, that mode of panic. So I, I think that might make me a bad candidate for philosophical therapy, I think, for, for fear of death, because I think once you, once you're that panicked, it's hard to, hard to come back. And the truth is, I hope this, this is the, the chapter on death sort of, um, vindicates my honesty as a philosophical therapist. And I'm pretty clear that for me, what philosophers say about death is not really very reassuring. So there's a kind of, you know, when you're dead, you won't exist. You won't experience any pain. Don't worry about and, it. Um, and we should tell listeners, you rule out any religious comfort yes, that might that's be right, available. That's right. I'm imagining which, death as non-existence. And, yeah. and that would be true for the rest of the book, by the way. There's no um, religious path that leads to meaning or purpose or comfort. or. No, um, it's true. It's true. Although I think, you know, the, the idea of atelic activities and existential value, I, I imagine that if you're religious, one of the kind of things you could say about your relationship to God or your relationship to a religious community is that they're forms of existentially valuable activity. They're atelic. They, they don't involve some kind of project you're trying to complete, but a kind of way of being. So I think it slots in in a way, but it's true that it's just not part of my native way of, of thinking about these things. But yeah, so I, I mean, I, I'm, this is an, an idea that goes back to Epicurus and Lucretius, that death isn't bad because you won't exist and you won't be in pain, assuming non-existence. As many philosophers point, have pointed out, it's not super reassuring because <laughs> uh, you don't need to exist in order to be missing out on things. In fact, the opposite. If you don't exist uh, anymore, you're going to miss out on everything. And that the the harm of death might partly consist, presumably for those who um, are living good enough lives, does consist in being deprived of all the good things. There's also a kind of temporal symmetry argument. So Lucretius Epicurus also invite us to compare the non-existence of our post-mortem lives, lack of lives, to our prenatal non-existence and say, you're not terrified about prenatal non-existence. Why are you worried about post-mortem non-existence? Again, I think not super convincing because I think there's something perfectly rational about being temporally biased. That's to say, caring more about future pleasures and pains than past ones. I mean, one reason why um, the strategy you described about overcoming regrets works is that we actually don't care that much about past pains in the way someone tells you, hey, by the way, 
you don't know this, but on some day in the past, you experienced a lot of pain, but you've forgotten it. I would think, okay, well, whatever. If you told me, oh, by the way, in a few weeks time, you're going to experience a lot of intense pain. Afterwards, you won't remember it. I'll say, okay, <laughs> I guess it's better not to remember it. Maybe, I don't know, but this is terrifying. So there's a kind of temporal asymmetry in our relationship to pains and pleasures that I think makes the deprivation of pleasures that death presents quite reasonably more upsetting than the, the, the deprivation that prenatal non-existence prevents, uh, sort of presents. I would say the, this doesn't really work for me, but I think that the kind of reframing of death that I think comes closest to making a difference to how I think about it is to sort of think about what it would mean not to die and to think about what you're wishing for when you think, I don't want to die. So what you're wishing for is not to be mortal, and in fact, to be immortal, to carry on living forever. Now, some philosophers argue that immortality will be positively bad, and that's one way to get used to death. I'm not convinced by those arguments. But one thing you can say about immortality is that it's a kind of superpower. So in a way, I think there's something disproportionate about the kind of natural reaction to death that people like me have, which is there's all kinds of superpowers it would be cool to have. I wish I could fly. I wish I could see through walls. I wish I could be invisible. Those things would be cool, but they're just not within the realm of human possibility. So I think of them as sort of idle wishes. I don't agonize about the fact that I'm not superhuman. And there's something peculiar about death in that I do agonize about the fact that I'm going to die. But what I'm agonizing about is in effect the fact that I don't have a superpower. It's like thinking, I wish I was a godlike immortal. Well, and, th and reacting not by thinking, not as if that will be a super cool power, but thinking it's a grave insult to my being that I'm not, like to, to be agonized about that. And I don't know how consoling that is, but I think there is something to that way of thinking about fear of death that helps put it in perspective and that I think is at least worth dwelling on. But I'll, I, I'll be honest, for me, there is no philosophical, philosophical therapy for death that has really worked yet. I'm still on the lookout. I, I sometimes have this idea, I had the, after finishing my last book, I thought, I have this sort of fantasy of one day setting myself the project of writing a book about death and deciding that it's not done until I have cured my fear of death. Like the, the task for the book would be get, keep working on philosophical thinking about death until you're cool with dying. And however long it takes, there's no rush, you know, it could be the rest of your life and you may not finish it, but that's the project. And there's, there's something appealing about that to be honest. There's some kind of compelling thought that I do think this, this idea of philosophy is learning how to die. I wish philosophy could do that for me, but it hasn't yet. I guess my first thought is that if this bothered you as a boy, I think you were meant to be a philosopher and not a doctor. <laughs> but um, I, I mean, that's actually it was a joke, but I mean, I think it's true. Um, I had a different thought about the pain and the pleasure um, and forgottenness of it that I want to try out on you. And then I want to sure. give you a, a different art. Maybe I can comfort you on the death thing. Make my attempt. Okay. I'm not, I'm not optimistic. Uh, it's a Worth long the try. I, I I'll, I'll take any effort. Yeah. So the first thing is, you know, you said, suppose I said to you, you, um, you had this horrible pain, uh, but you know, you, you, you were, you were screaming like a maniac. It was so horrible, but you, you had a memory incident and you don't remember it. But let me tell you, you were really suffering and you would say, okay, like you said, whatever. But if I said, do you remember when the, Red Sox won the World Series, and you said, no, I missed that. Oh, yeah, you were blacked out. You had that drug thing you were on, and uh, you missed that joy you would have had, that first Red Sox World Series since 1918. You wouldn't, you wouldn't go, oh, well, whatever. You, you would feel yeah. there's a real difference. And I think I, I, th I think we're wired uh, by God or nature to feel very differently about past pain and past pleasure. I, I think – Maybe it's me, so I'd, I'd be curious your reaction. But the things that that were that have been painful in my life, physical—I'm talking about physical pain right now. Um, I don't 
they don't haunt me at, at all. Um, and I think that's why some women have more than one child. Uh, you know, the, the it's not that it's just that. Well, the kid was worth it. It's that the pain of childbirth falls into this strange category. You know, we we moved to Jerusalem this year. Um, our the heat in our apartment didn't work. We ended up our landlord gave us two radiators. We're really cold. Um, they didn't work very well. It was the coldest winter in recorded history in Jerusalem. <laughs> and now I think it's kind of funny and kind of cool. I bad word, but I, I didn't. I, we were uncomfortable at the time. I remember it, but I don't have any any after effects of that. None, except for a little yeah. bit of humor, joking about it. But my joys, I can talk about those and enjoy them still. So I, first of all, so I think there's an incredible asymmetry in in pain versus pleasure that way. That is really interesting. I mean, I, I think the the deprivation of pleasure cases is, is quite striking. I mean, one thing to think about, though, it's tricky with something like the Red Sox winning. I mean, the temporal asymmetry would involve something like the following thought. Suppose I tell you, you did have the pleasure of watching the Red Sox win in the past. It's just you've forgotten it. Or they're going to win next year and you'll enjoy it. You've got that to look forward to, but you'll forget it afterwards. I think you might... I don't know if you, what you think about that kind of comparison. Mm -hmm. There I'm thinking, it's complicated because in the case of the Red Sox winning, part of the pleasure is you don't know in advance. Like you, you, you want it to be a surprise. You don't want, to be, don't, not, don't right. want it to be a foregone conclusion. So that case is complicated. But I think you might, in that case, want it to be in the, in the future. I think Let's the, take the, the trip to Paris. The trip yeah. to Paris that I had with my wife two years ago, which is wonderful, and I have great memories of it. If you said to me, was, yeah, you're going to go in a few months again, but you won't remember any of it, I'd go, I'd be horrified. Yeah, <laughs> right. So I, I think the other thing you're pointing to is this, is this something that came up earlier on, which is the joys of retrospection, the sort of thought that it's possible with pleasures in the past to generate pleasures in the present, at least certain kinds of pleasures in the past, that reminiscing about them and remembering them is pleasant. And so the loss of memory is a real, not being able to remember them would be a real tragedy, it would be a real loss. Whereas when it comes to pain, we just don't want to think about it. And that's perfectly reasonable. And if we, if we lost memory of it, that would not be a terrible thing. So I, th I think there's something, something to that, but I think it's compatible with the idea that, you know, it, other things being equal, if it, if you were looking at a pleasure in the past and a pleasure in the future, and if in both cases, you're not going to remember, you might think, well, yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll take the pleasure in the future. But, but I think you're right that, that the loss of memory is a kind of significant it's not a negligible feature of what's going on in these in these sort of philosophers' thought experiments, and and it gives you a great cognitive therapy trick, which which I'd forgotten about, and now I'm ready to re uh, oh, yeah. re re uh, use, which is that that pain that I'm anticipating the trip to the dentist, the, the or the surgery, God forbid, or whatever it is, the that's temporary temporary. Right. You know, I just have to get through it. And when it's over, it's going to be like, you know, it's done. Yeah. It's not going to haunt me. Yeah. Whereas pleasures are different. You savor them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, so I, I this is something, I, there's a chapter on this in, in my new book, in, in Life is Hard, about infirmity. And I talk about various kinds of infirmity. But one of them is I have a chronic pain condition. And one of the things that I talk about sort of, that, I, that I think is important in understanding that is that for me, in the moment or day to day, the pain is just not that bad. I mean, it, it varies. Sometimes it stops you from sleeping. Other times it's not. If it, and somehow, if it was just a series of temporary pains, and I could just experience it that way, like here's an hour of discomfort, here's another hour, I don't think it would be anywhere near as bad as it is. The problem is retrospection is... is the fact that, and, and anticipation, it's the sense that once you're in, your, once you're in it, you, you look forward to it. You're, you're anticipating it and unable to imagine on the, being on the other side of it. And you can't really remember what it was like to not be in pain. And it's those temporal forward and backward looking things that make chronic pain particularly challenging. And so I think that the kind of thing you described as saying it's temporary if you could somehow inhabit chronic pain with the mode, it's temporary, 
I mean, it's, it's true that there's another one coming, but each one is temporary. If you could somehow make that shift, I think that would very much diminish the power. And I think that's why a lot of sort of mindfulness techniques are effective in dealing with chronic pain is that you just can't, you do not want to be thinking, oh my God, I'm going to feel like this tomorrow. When will I ever not feel like this? Or, you know, reflecting on the past. You just want want to think, well, right now, it's not preventing me from doing what I want to be doing. And, you know, a day of moderate pain, people just get on with their lives. So I'll just do that. And every day will be like that. If you could experience it like that. And I think the goal in a, in a way for me is to just experience it like that, just to think it's another perfectly okay day, which is on balance. Good. Don't worry about the fact that every day is like that. Just, just keep going. And, uh, I think that, that, fits exactly with what you were just with what you're just saying okay so let me try my death comfort and then yeah, yeah. And we'll, we'll end sure so <clears throat> it's a kind of a version of of your argument that you don't like which um it's a superpower argument but for me and I, you know i've had a i have like you, I think I've, I've been very blessed, very fortunate to have a good life. And I think that helps a lot in thinking about death. And in your case, not enough. Okay. You need, the, you know, 72 articles, huge yeah. disappointment <laughs> before you got to 81. But right. more seriously, you know, I think a life poorly lived is, is a – death is, is, is harder uh, because there, there comes a chance for, without redemption. Um, so I think for – you know, most of my, I think most of my listeners are young. I think they're in their 20 to 40. So one of the arguments here is to have a life well lived because um, it'll make your upward swing of the U even better. Uh, what that is exactly and how to get there from here is always challenging. But I think that's something to think about. But the other thing to think about is that for me, and again, I'm older than you, um, by a generation. For me, as I've gotten older, I enjoy bittersweet more than sweet. And I say this in my book. Um, there's something, the poignance of death adds a, uh, a richness to day-to-day -day life. The, the kind of pleasures we were talking about earlier, uh, that they're not homogenous, that they're varied and, and unique. As you get older, the, the fact that it's that the end is in sight, even if it's God willing, decades away, suddenly makes things more vivid. And obviously, it's a version of your point that if you live forever, things are kind of boring. Is it, there's a certain emptiness to it, but but there's this flip side that's even that, that enhances the argument, which is that it also means that that the things you do enjoy are that much more powerful. And I, I've. I've sung this song. I'm not going to sing it again, but I've sung it before on this program. The song "May I Suggest" by Susan Werner. Google it, um, and it's uh, she sings it at the Philly Folk Festival. It's a live version. There are a number of versions of it, but it's a very beautiful song. And and part of the the theme of the song is, you know, enjoy the moment, which is part of what you write about in your book about being present, and how precious those moments are because they are finite. Now, obviously, that's that's a plus. But it's more than a plus. I'm, I'm arguing that it uh, – maybe I'm, maybe it's not a good argument, but I'm trying to argue that it intensifies the pleasure you do get. And maybe this is my utilitarian side coming out. Uh, but I think it's more than that. I think it's the kind of pleasure. It's a bittersweet pleasure. It's, it's knowing that there aren't that many more times you're going to hug your loved ones and um, write one more article and do those projects that, you know, you think they're kind of meaningless <clears throat> after a while, but – when, you're, when you can't do any more, they're not meaningless. They're really powerful. So, I don't know, just a thought. I, no, I, I, I think it, I can see the attraction or, or the, the wisdom of, of looking at things that way. And I, I need to just, I, this is something I really do want to think about more is how to, whether there's a way to reframe just to, to understand human life in a way that truly brings out the sort of truly, truly reconciles me to mortality. I think one thing to say about that is that I, temperamentally, I think I'm quite phlegmatic. I think my highs are not that high and my lows are not that low. Um, and so 
it's true that there's the intensity of sort of the, the precious rare moment, but I don't know how, maybe I don't have a good enough imagination of what it would be like to lose that if I was, if I was truly, if I was immortal and, and maybe if I could properly inhabit the, the immortal perspective, I, I would think, man, what, I, what wouldn't I give to, to appreciate something that had that preciousness again? I, I don't know. I mean, the, the argument that moves me, I suppose, for against immortality is, uh, is the, the overpopulation argument, which is mm. um, we, mm. we got to make room for the next generation. And I'm, I'm not a big fan of the idea that we're going to colonize space or that it would be a good idea to colonize space. I think we should, we should try to make Earth work with a somewhat smaller population and uh, we better clear out in order for the next generation to come along. And so morally speaking, I think there's a kind of pressure to accept that it will be unfair to occupy more than our fair fair space in the or fair fair time i guess rather than space on, on earth and that i think is 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 something i say to myself about why like it or not i better get used to it but none of it really touches the there's a kind of visceral reaction to thinking about it that that is a kind of terrifying electricity and i don't know quite how to how to reach that I'm going to try one more. Okay. So you talk about mindfulness in the book, and I've I've done some meditation, not so much lately, but I have. And I think one of the gifts of that when it works well is an appreciation for the day-to-day. And I don't know about you, but I have a lot of trouble doing that. It's not, yeah. It doesn't come easy, easy to me. Yeah. And I think it's true for most people that things go by. You miss out. I guess part of what I'm arguing, it's similar to my argument before about the imperfection of the brain, that it's hard to focus on the right things and we deceive ourselves into the illusion that we're doing something that's rational when in fact we're not. And that's this, as you get older, it's easier to notice. It seems like a feature, not a bug, maybe. I mean, I like, I, again, I, I kind of like that idea that the thing to do is, in a way, not think about the future, certainly not think about your impending death or your not so, hopefully not so impending death, and to sort of be able to focus on the value of what's happening day to day. And maybe that's it. Maybe the, 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 insofar as there's a philosophical therapy for death, it comes down to appreciating that there's it's not that there's a way of positively thinking about it that makes it okay. It, it's that there's a way of not thinking about it that is more in tune with what's actually valuable about life. And that's the, the thing to do. Um, and I suppose in practice, that's what I do is when, I'm, when I find my mind drifting, I think, okay, let's, <laughs> let's not think about death right now. Let's do something else. So, so part of, the, part of the, the idea of writing a book about it is, is perverse, which is, to decide I'm going to power through this and force myself to come out on the other side of it, where it might be the exact opposite of what I should be doing to come to terms with death. Like don't write it, do the opposite of writing a book about it. That might be the, uh, the answer. I don't know. I'm th- you know, I'm thinking of Samuel Johnson, the knowledge that a man's going to be hung in a fortnight concentrates his mind wonderfully, you know, yeah. there's something to be said there. There is. Yeah. Yeah. Although I, I'm not sure what, what, what it would make me do if I, there was, I was reading recently, I think it was maybe Nick Riggle and it w- was, has a chapter in a, in a, in a book of his where he's describing actually thinking death was imminent and, and whether, how it concentrated his mind. And he said his mind just emptied and he had absolutely no idea what to do. He was just like, ah. and I think, yeah, I'm, I'm a little worried that if that the, it would, it would not concentrate my mind in a particularly productive way or fruitful way. If I, if I really, really uh, started to worry about it, but. Hopefully, I will not have my mind concentrated for for a while. Uh, We were all on the same page there. My guest today has been Karen Setia. His book is Midlife. I'm looking forward to reading it a second time. Karen, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you so much for having me. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.